Outkick 360 across the Outkick network. Glad you're with us for the Tennessee Power Hour on this great Friday in Music City from Nashville, Tennessee. Studio G, the Blackbird Studio, Blackbird Academy, theblackbirdacademy.com for more information on how you can go to school and train to be the very best in your field at audio engineering, studio engineering, where you can be on the road or in studio over 14,000 square feet of rehearsal space and hands-on experience. TheBlackbirdAcademy.com for more information on that. Also, if you're watching on YouTube through the Outkick 360 YouTube channel, we appreciate you. Join the chat. We're in there now. And while you're there, we hope you'll subscribe to the channel. You can be entered to win the Sony and Hertz Audison prize pack exclusive for our YouTube subscribers. You hit subscribe, you ring that bell so that you're alerted every time we go live, you're automatically entered to win. If you're already subscribed, you are already entered to win the prize pack. We'll be drawing for a winner at the end of next month at the start of football season. You get everything with Sony and Hertz Audison plus the full car stereo system that includes those speakers. It's a value of over $2,500, and it's just straight to you, one winner, for subscribing to the YouTube channel. We appreciate you. Uh, and it's so easy. It's so easy yeah. to subscribe to our YouTube channel and get registered to win this great prize. Do it. It's yeah. easy. And then you're automatically alerted to it's all no the problem. programming. Yeah, it's, yep. it's very simple. Uh, thanks to David Reed and Jakob Swanson for making the show happen today. Regan McCrossan, our great production assistant uh, on Fridays. Also, Becca Risley, Sleepy Danny. At some point, they're both having the weekend takeover on our yes. Instagram account, Outkick360. Paul's got it this weekend coming up. He'll take over the Instagram story where they're having the, uh, the puppy delivered to the Goharskis. Very mysterious delivery method with this puppy. Yeah. Very mysterious I hope it's payment. all documented. And uh, you know, hopefully we see the whole process of, of this puppy. And I look forward to Sleepy Danny's uh, turn, and uh, I just want uh, pictures of him sleeping, <laughs> just all over the place. Like uh, if, if there's a hammock in his yard, <laughs> in his bed, on his couch, in a recliner, I want to see all the different places that Sleepy Danny can sleep over the course of one weekend. Can't wait for that. It's gonna be great. <laughs> Can't wait for sleep. It's not creepy at all that a grown man wants to watch another grown man sleep, is it? <laughs> Uh, the, the Hutton and I have roomed together in the past. Hopefully we won't be doing that anymore, but there are times where Hutton will wake up in his bed to just me staring at him, sleeping. <laughs> Fully dressed, showered, ready to go to work. Hey, ready to go? And I'm just staring at Hutton, uh, probably a foot from his face. Chad, Chad gets up early. He's like, man, I got two kids. I'm ready to go. Yeah, I'm up at, uh, now it's, I'm like Kramer with the internal clock. Even if a kid's not screaming, I'm hearing a kid screaming at 6 a.m. <laughs> in, in my ear, and I'm, I'm up at, if, if I wake up and look over at 6.30, I'm thinking, well, I'm up for the day. That's it. Not going back to sleep. Um, coming up, we'll talk with Russell Smith of Fox Sports Knoxville, one of uh, our stations across the Outkick Network, and right now our station on radio across the Outkick Network. You always remember your first. Yes. And our first was Fox Sports Knoxville and Fan Run Radio. We appreciate them. We'll chat with Russell Smith coming up. Hubs and uh, Austin Price have the week off. A lot of the college coaches are on vacation this week. That means VolQuest also on vacation. A well-deserved uh, time off for both of them. John McClain has checked in from the cottage, overlooking the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland, and uh, it's beautiful. He sent a video as well, which we cannot get to resend for some reason. Uh, we'll post it later, but he gave us the 360 view. Here's the cottage that John's driving and moving into. And to the right, if you were to just turn the camera to the right, it overlooks the Chesapeake Bay. It looks like something that was made for a movie. I don't know why. It feels very familiar. It feels like I've seen this in television or film. Like it's almost like a movie set. It's so picturesque and quaint. Oh, this Chad. cottage, this cottage by the what, sea. What is the name of the of the miniseries we just watched? With uh, we all of us were. I binged it. Claire was watching it. Um, Kate Winslet was in it. Oh, Mayor of Easttown. Mayor of Easttown. Yeah. This looks like a house in Mayor of Easttown. That looks a little nicer than the houses in Mayor of Easttown, <laughs> but it's, yes, it's, a, it's from a similar <laughs> era of, uh, of Mayor of Easttown. Mayor of Easttown does a great job as a show of really putting you in the middle of that setting. <laughs> like you feel yeah. the grime of whatever town they're in, you know, east of Philadelphia. 
Uh, it is. Uh, it, it, it. You feel the whole thing. And I look at McLean's Cottage, and if we can get this video, which by the way is already one of my favorite videos of all time, of John McLean explaining and and uh, with a video of everything around the grounds at his compound uh, up in Maryland, um, you're gonna feel the same way, John. He's got a movie history as a cinematographer, much like the cinematography of Mayor of Easttown. It really puts you in time and place, and you're gonna feel like you were there with John McClain, wearing shorts with crabs on them, with flip-flops, getting ready to walk to his favorite restaurant of his and Carol's uh, that is just a stone's throw across the, the harbor uh, from, his, from his cottage. And it's, it's really he's terrific. And since checked in again with another video of his neighbor's boats. Currently, he does not own a sailboat. His neighbor does. Uh, and it's, it's quite the view. We'll get that up as well through our social media accounts. And Quite frankly, we missed a huge opportunity here. We didn't know John was in Maryland until today. Uh, this would have been an epic Instagram takeover with John well, McClain. Well, it would have been an epic uh, visit with John McClain if we get him while he's at the cottage with that backdrop. Yeah. Like, I want John on a boat doing it one time. I, I want to see, I wanna see like, <laughs> him being tousled about on a boat Yachting. while he's on with us. Yes. Well, on a hammock on his property. Yeah, scarf tied around back. his neck. Yeah, we're going to have the, the Sleepy Danny take over where he sleeps. He's and sailing. We get John McClain in a hammock with the computer up. Uh, with a as mimosa. He, as he's on with us, yes. DiCaprio style. Right. I see John as more of um, like a Bloody Mary type <laughs> okay. out there, right? The mimosa. I don't know. Just, it's, it's Either bloody, way, he's lounging. Bloody Mary seems more Either way, he's, for John he's lounging. McClain. He's definitely lounging. <laughs> John knows how to fit in a good nap when needed. Coming up, Russell Smith never naps. Always on the air in Knoxville. He joins us, one of our affiliates for Outkick 360. We're going to talk all things Tennessee football during this Tennessee Power Hour. Hang with us on Outkick 360. Outkick 360 across the Outkick network, which includes Fox Sports, Knoxville, Fan Run Radio, 1340 AM, 105.7 in Knoxville. And the host of The Drive is Russell Smith right there in K-Town. He joins us on OutKick 360. Russell, it is great to have you on the show for the first time, and it was a pleasure meeting you earlier this spring for the Orange and White pre- and post-show. Uh, you guys do a great job down there. First and foremost, I, I, I make the remark every now and then, you always remember your first. We are thrilled to true, be on in statement. Knoxville, and uh, we appreciate all that you and, and the entire station there has done for us. Oh, the feeling is mutual. Uh, love having you guys on the station and uh, love being on with you guys for the first time. I got to ask that guitar back there. Now, if you had yeah. your choice, would you rather be able to pick it up and play it or just smash it Jeff Jarrett style? Well, this is actually both. So you can actually play it. Yeah. Uh, and I'm told it's in tune, but this is a guitar from Double J. The Jeff Jarrett. Uh, right. Yeah, he, he gifted this to the studio. Well, not just gifted it. Uh, as part of a fundraiser, we had people that donated money to see Double J smash a guitar over Koharski's head. And, oh. and so he, he brought the guitar in as a reminder that this is, this is eventually going to be worn by Paul. Not played by Paul, but worn by Paul. So this is uh, J-E-double-F's, yeah. J-A-double-R-E-double-T's guitar right here. Jeff Jarrett. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And uh, I hope you get good video of that being smashed over somebody's head. That would be outstanding. Russell, uh, may I start with a suggestion? Um, your profile pic on Twitter, you need to be standing in it. Because uh, when I met you, you really fooled me because I thought you were going to be about six inches shorter. <laughs> and uh, you, you mentioned also that people always say they expect someone to be fatter when they meet you. <laughs> and I'm looking at your profile pic and I'm thinking it's kind of at a distance. And you're seated. Like we need you standing up in the profile pic to, to accurately full body, please. show your size. Yes, I am. I am full body only over here. All right. We don't need just torso. We certainly don't need just lower body. Also, we we need a full body shot of Russell. Yeah, that's uh, well, uh, that's the first time anyone has ever asked for one of those. Let me tell you. But uh, uh, yeah, it, that's actually. Uh, I get that a lot. I thought you would be older. I thought you would be fatter. I don't know. I guess I have a fat voice. I don't, I don't know what a fat voice is, but apparently I have one. It's called radio. Well, if you said your occupation is sports talk radio, I would assume you're fat. I think that's where that comes from. It's like you hear occupations and you yeah. have in your mind what that person probably looks like. And if you go on uh, Radio Row at the Super Bowl or SEC Media Days, 
a lot of times they're right. There's a lot of big people that are in Sports Talk Radio. So it sort of makes sense. So uh, help me with this as we get to some football uh, discussion here, Russell. Uh, how, how do you envision Heupel's offense in 2021? Tell me, uh, it's not necessarily wins or losses uh, to me. How, how are we kind of grading him? Where's the bar set right now for what we expect this offense to look like? Well, I was going to say, to hear him tell it, I envision uh, the quarterbacks throwing 100-yard passes to the receivers who are playing on horseback. Yeah. But I don't know. Yeah. We're going to see that right out of the gate. I mean, look, Tennessee fans get a bad rap of being uh, unrealistic, unrealistic expectations, and I don't think that's true at all. I don't think anybody expects a miracle right out of the gates for Josh Heupel. I think they just want to see an offense that is, is fun uh, and score some points and has a vision, all right? Again, I don't think anybody expects this year to be the finished product, but what will it look like when you have his quarterback in developed with these uh, speedy wide receivers? They got another commitment yesterday from a guy who's like 5'10", 150 pounds, but apparently he can, he can run like the wind. So show us the vision. What is it going to look like in two or three years when hopefully the NCAA cloud is behind you, you've got your guys in, you're a system established, mm -hmm. And, you know, you look at it everywhere he's been, whether it's been at Oklahoma or at Missouri or at Central Florida, he's averaged about 40 points a game. And if he can find a way to replicate that at Tennessee, eventually, I think fans will be more or less satisfied with that kind of offense. Russell, you mentioned the recruit. Uh, great nickname also, Squirrel, is the name of the receiver, yeah. <laughs> uh, which is a great nickname for a speedy, smaller, wide receiver. Um, I had a chance to talk to Valus Jones Jr. last night at this event, and we were talking about Heupel's offense. And what I brought up was, you mentioned his, his prior work at those other schools. I remember when he was the offensive coordinator at Missouri, I believe it was a game in Knoxville, Drew Locke was the quarterback, and my takeaway from his offense was you could just never relax, right? It would be a two-yard run, a three-yard run, then they throw a 45-yard bomb in a matter of 22 seconds because they're snapping the ball so quickly. Or then they, they hit, hit a huge run at some point. There was always, once you kind of got lulled to sleep a little bit, boom, there was a big shot down the field. Uh, there was something big happening with his offense. And Bayless Jones Jr. echoed that, and he said, they're trying to snap the ball every five or six seconds. They want five seconds to go off the play clock, and the ball's being snapped. That's how quick they want to play. So I guess my question is, with what he's inherited offensively, do you think they're capable of playing the offense that he really wants to play in year one? Um, I would say probably not. Uh, you know, again, I don't know if you're going to average 40 points a game right out of the shoots, but uh, wherever the bar has been set, I mean, whatever it was last year, like 23, 24 points a game, if you can improve on that, um, I mean, that, that shouldn't be hard. Right. But uh, I, I would be surprised if they're able to do that. Now, you might be able to do it against the Bowling Greens and the Tennessee Techs of the world, maybe even against the South Carolinas and Vanderbilts of the world. But uh, I, I would be stunned if you're able to do it against Florida, Georgia, Alabama. And I would even be surprised if, again, just year one, if you were able to play that way against um, yeah, uh, Kentucky uh, Missouri teams like that, which are going to be the quote unquote swing games that you're going to have to win to have uh, a decent season, which I think this year is, if you look at the odds makers, it's what six and a half wins or something like that for Tennessee, you know, seven or eight wins. I think most Tennessee fans would be more than satisfied with that in year one, but I don't think they're going to uh, come out uh, looking like 2019 LSU right out of the gates. But if they can look better than whatever it's been the past couple of years uh, under Jeremy Pruitt, then I think fans will be uh, tickled with that. Yeah, I agree. You know, can they can they put up more than seven or thirteen points against Kentucky's defense? Right, like that's that's what I'm gauging here. I, I, I entertain. I want to be entertained when I watch Tennessee football, and that has not been the case in recent years offensively, um, where you have to win these slugfests instead of going out and and you know making sure that you put it in the air. I, I would compare it to and, and Ole Miss is better. Um, but you know, Ole Miss didn't win a lot of games, but Kiffin made – I remember Kiffin's loss more than I do the wins. I remember what they did against Alabama's defense. Sure. I, I, that's what I want to see week in and week out, and eventually you want to see them progress 
to back up the top of the SEC East. But first and foremost, show some progress on the field with where you're headed and, and act like you're in the 21st century with all of it. And, and Russell, how big would it be? Hutton mentioned the, the Ole Miss lost Alabama. I was talking about this with some of the Tennessee players last night. How big it would be to have a loss like that That's what against I'm Georgia yeah. or yeah. Florida or Alabama on your schedule where you surprise everyone and you're hanging around in a game you're not supposed to and it's exciting to the very end and you're putting up a ton of points. Uh, against a really good defense. I mean, that that would be a big-time progress for Tennessee. A, a close loss. This is where we're at, ladies yes. and gentlemen. Just give, give well, us a close but, loss. Uh, but an entertaining loss, I think, more than just yeah, close, it, Russell. Right? Like, you're <laughs> scoring a lot of points and losing 58-50. I mean, to 50 Yeah, well, the game. point, the, I think the point, and I agree I with you, Chad, you. Is, is going into the Georgia game, you were hoping that Tennessee would score over 21 points and that Georgia would turn the football over a couple of times. And they were able to put up, what, 14, 17 points in what was a blowout loss uh, against the Georgia Bulldogs. Like, it, it, it happened how everyone feared it would go uh, instead of actually just being a shootout. Even, even if you lose, you felt like the, the team was making progress against the team you're chasing. Yeah, I mean, it's like I said earlier. Just, just show us a vision. Show us what where you're going with this thing. We don't expect you to go from uh, black and white to crystal clear HD color TV overnight but uh show us a path to get where you're going and uh, i do agree yeah i mean uh, nobody expects you to beat alabama in year one nobody expects you to win you know that florida game will be interesting early because they're not quite on Flo uh, georgia alabama's level right uh but they are a good program obviously can you go down there and put some points on put some pressure on them you know take that game into the fourth quarter and and make them fight to to the very end which they kind of did last year but nobody remembers it because the the season had already gone belly up by then but uh put some pressure on some teams hang around be in some games and uh and you know maybe maybe uh win one that uh, you're not supposed to i, I think tennessee fans uh, just give them some reason uh to hope to be optimistic for the future because uh quite frankly i mean this right now is it's it's the football program who cried wolf right i mean yeah we've heard this before you can't and you can't fault tennessee fans for not jumping on board the bandwagon with both feet right out of the gate uh you know Derek dooley told them this lane kiffin told them it was going to be better um butch told him it would be better and pruitt told him we'd be, be better so this isn't josh heupel's fault that people aren't just buying in on blind faith alone right out of the gates here it's just a product of everything that the fan base has been through the last 13 years but if you can give them a reason to believe uh, a little poison give me something to believe and that was poison right uh right out of the gates i think tennessee fans would be satisfied with that in year one russell does josh heifel get a pass in year one in recruiting because of everything going on with the ncaa investigation uh, around this is it just Whatever you can get, get, and don't really rate the job he's doing or his staff in recruiting because of everything else around it? I mean, he should, right? Um, I mean, can you imagine what the other SEC schools, what this league of vultures are telling <laughs> Tennessee recruits on the, on the telephone and on these visits? Oh, you don't want to go there. You're not going to be able to go to a bowl game for your first two years. They're going to lose scholarships. The fan base is crazy. You're gonna they're gonna run hype out of there in two or three years anyway. I mean, it's got to be brutal right now. The negative recruiting going on against Tennessee. So yeah, I mean the the fact that they've got nine commitments might be a, a, a minor victory in and of itself. So um, I, I think that's the biggest thing for right now. I mean, we talk about what does Tennessee need to do on the field uh, this fall. The best thing that could happen for Tennessee is to get some sort of clarity regarding the NCAA situation. I mean. If, if you know whether it's in a month two months three months like w whatever it is just so they can go to these prospects and say oh, here's the deal here's what it is don't listen to what these schools are telling you it might be uh don't even listen to us what they're telling you it might be this is what it is this is whether it's one year two years probation whatever a couple of scholarships they just need uh, that clarity and again to get back to the fan base i think that's what, uh, another reason that fans are hesitant to jump on board the hypo bandwagon is just because they don't know what it's going to look like. Are, are they going to be able to go to a bowl game this year? Are they going to be able to go to a bowl game next year in 2022? Uh, they can't answer those questions right now. So it's really difficult, I think, for some fans to get excited. Russell Smith hosts The Drive on Fox Sports Knoxville Fan Run Radio. Uh, and uh, you can also hear Outkick 360 in the evenings on Fox Sports Knoxville. Russell, um, 
kids are making their decisions a little bit earlier than usual. It's a busy June in recruiting. Does that hurt Tennessee in a way that they can't get these kids on campus for official visits in the fall on game day um, instead of kids making their decision now and taking their official visits now uh, for, for the University of Tennessee? Would you, if you had your pick, do you think they would choose to have these guys in in the fall? Well, I mean, I think you can do visits in the fall, but uh, they're doing they're doing them earlier and earlier now in the yes. summer. And uh, I mean, that was that. Uh, yeah, that, I, I think that's a major detriment to Heupel and his staff right now is just because they haven't they don't know these kids and they weren't they spent the first what uh, five months in Knoxville unable right. to talk to anybody other than Zoom or or over the phone or DMing on social media. So um, that was a huge detriment. And I think that you, you've seen some of these commitments popping for Tennessee now because they were able to spend the month of June actually meeting players face to face and being able to pitch them and walk them around campus and show them everything. And uh, they just they had zero of that. Right. And so everybody else they're recruiting against um, as, as the staffs have been there for multiple years. They've already met these players in person. Uh, they, they know a little bit more about the programs and, and vice versa. So uh, it was a huge disadvantage. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that if uh, Tennessee had their druthers, um, they would the, – these prospects that they're still recruiting, just wait. You know, just, just wait until the fall. Come see us on a game day. Come see Neyland Stadium. Um, and hopefully by then we'll know what we're dealing with the NCAA and you'll be able to make a much more informed decision. Russell, I joined on your show in Knoxville yesterday, and we talked a little bit about this. With NIL and Tennessee specifically, every program out there is going to have some sort of plan, and the big programs that win are going to have every advantage that every program's out there trying to find. But I really think that Tennessee and some other state schools could find an advantage with in-state prospects and businesses that are in the state of Tennessee getting behind in-state kids to stay in-state and go play at the flagship university in Tennessee. Do you think that's the case with Tennessee, or is it just simply everyone's going to be playing the same game and Tennessee's going to have every disadvantage or advantage that they've had in the past? Yeah, it's an interesting question, right? I mean, I, I think that there there could be a little bit of that. If you have, I mean, it's like uh, we, we talk to a lot of people uh, in who, who want advertising sales jobs here in East Tennessee, and the people that are from East Tennessee and have grown up here have such an advantage over folks who might have moved here for college or even uh, later on in their lives because they know where the money is. They know who to go ask for. They know, okay, this person owns uh, this set of restaurants. This company owns this set of restaurants. And it's just, it, it's such an intuitive advantage that uh, those folks will have. So maybe a little bit. Um, I, I just think it, it's interesting that uh, we're seeing some of these deals uh, maybe even start to slow down a little bit right out of the gates. I think that some of these players might have had unrealistic expectations. All these college football players think that, uh, you know, they're a personal brand, right? And that uh, they're going to be able to go out there and, and really help people out in, in the local business community. And uh, except for a handful of players, I don't know if that's true. What's going to be interesting to me is are we going to see more of what we saw at Miami this week where you have companies come in and offer to pay all the players? And to me, that would be a huge recruiting advantage if you can go and say look it doesn't matter if you don't play your first year you're going to be getting a cut of this money from company x uh, no matter what and I, I would feel like if i were a recruit that would be very enticing knowing that uh you know i'm going to be getting a little bit of something and then i don't have to go out and chase it is the other thing is i don't have to go out and, and beat the bushes knock on doors looking for that money it's already set up as soon as i get on campus what are you hearing for the other sports on campus other than football? Have, have, has there been a lot of NIL discussion involving particular athletes? Not really. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, uh, maybe some. I, I think that, for instance, like if you're uh, the Tennessee baseball program, uh, most Tennessee fans couldn't name you one Tennessee baseball player this time last year. Uh, for, fast forward to right now, and, and mo uh, a lot of fans could probably go through the entire lineup, right? So. If you catch fire, if you have some visibility, uh, you might be able to market yourself. I mean, look, these uh, business people who are successful are successful for a reason. They're not throwing away money and they're not going to um, advertise on radio shows with no audience and they're not going to pay 
uh, players who nobody's ever heard of to endorse their products. And I think everybody's just, uh, you know, oh my God, the floodgates are, are going to open. I haven't really seen that. I mean, some of these deals have been interesting, but I think once this settles down, people are just going to look at it as second nature. And yeah, you're going to see the the players that are really good and they're going to go to the NFL or the NBA, Major League Baseball, are going to have opportunities. And the players who, who aren't, who aren't household names, uh, it's going to be more of a struggle for them. Russell, well, so what's been your impression of Danny White and the job he's done so far? Has there been a massive change with the athletic department since he took over? And what, what are some of the, I guess, pros and cons of, of the job he's done so far in Knoxville? I know it's been a short time, but the job he's done so far. Well, yeah, it's like the football coaches, right? I mean, it's been a revolving door out there. I will say this. For right now, I think Danny White's doing what he needs to be doing, which is namely just keeping his mouth shut. We haven't heard from him in a while. I mean, coming out in your introductory press conference and telling the entire fan base to basically shut their pie holes, that's an interesting approach. But uh, we haven't heard from him much anymore. I think if he can go ahead and have that press conference where he announces that he's signed Tony Vitello to a long-term deal and we're going to redo Lindsey Nelson Stadium, that's as big of a win right now as he could hope for. So I think that should be the next time Tennessee fans hear from Danny White is, you know, hey, here's here's this, this guy that you all love. And uh, there was some rumors that he might be leaving town. We locked him up. We're keeping him. I think that would be big for him. I mean, look, again, nobody expects Danny White to, to work miracles. is a tough job that he walks into. Um, but, you know, the, the second time we hear from him is the Josh Heupel introductory. He says, look, you know, I, this was my first choice. Well, nobody believes that, right? Um, but there's a reason that Heupel got the job. It was a hard job to give away, uh, given the circumstances that he inherited back then. So, uh, I think that it's, you know, you can't judge him uh, just on a couple of months of work. Ultimately, it's going to come down to whether or not Heupel works out. Um, hey, I'll give him this. Everything else other than football is going well right now, right? Uh, Rick Barnes basketball program going very well. Uh, the baseball program is going well. Softball has been uh, solid. All the other sports, I think they won a national championship in tennis or something, maybe a conference championship a couple of weeks ago. But uh, at the end of the day, nobody cares about that. It's a football school. You got to fix football, and ultimately, that's what Danny White's going to be judged on. Am I right in thinking that not a, speaking of uh, what you're judged on and what people care about? Do people do, do your do your listeners care about the investigation that's going on with the NCAA? Is it is it a driving topic? If it's not a daily basis, a weekly basis, how often are you actually discussing it? Because at this point, it sounds like all the interviews are done and we're sitting around waiting on the NCAA. I haven't heard anyone actually ask that question in a while. Yeah, it comes up a lot. But, uh, I mean, I, I think that, you know, we were told a couple of months ago, oh, it's wrapping up. It should be done in two right. weeks. And then two right. weeks later, oh, two more weeks. And uh, I heard something like eight to ten weeks today was the <laughs> latest time frame. And they, like, people have just kind of uh, – it, it's a big deal. People are, are really interested in it. Like I said earlier, I think that's the single biggest – thing that Tennessee needs mm -hmm. clarity on right now uh, across the entire board when it comes to athletics is is just what exactly are they looking at so uh, yeah I mean it it, it comes up uh, I would say once a day if not uh, at least weekly we, we talk about it on the show but I mean what is there to say at, at this point uh, like you said uh, I believe that we we kind of know what they uh, did allegedly what they're looking at what yeah. the penalties may be um, but here's the other thing, this monkey wrench about the NCAA and its eroding influence right now is, uh, does this change the way you work with the NCAA if you're Tennessee now that it seems like they've got so much on their plate, there's so much criticism working against it. Um, is there a way that you could sort of wriggle off the hook, so to speak, for some of this to, just because the NCAA doesn't want to deal with it because they've got so many other bigger fish to fry? And this is normally the VolQuest Power Hour, so I'll, I'll reference VolQuest and, and in the, the war room today. The first reference I've seen in that article, Russell, to Tennessee not having a bowl ban at all. Uh, that what they think that they may turn over to the NCAA is a scholarship reduction of some sort, and that's it. And then seeing what the NCAA will do. And you mentioned the eroding influence of the NCAA. I'm curious if that has something to do with suddenly Tennessee may be starting to think that 
Maybe they can get away with no bowl ban and not the two or three years of bowl bans like some other SEC schools are selling to recruits. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see. And if you didn't have all this name, image, and likeness stuff and all the criticism that Mark Emmert is facing, would that calculus be a little bit different? Would Tennessee more, be more likely to fall on a little bit of a sharper sword, perhaps? But uh, this could be a silver lining for Tennessee in all this is if you go to the NCAA and say, uh, look, <laughs> you know, we, we know you got – all kinds of other, you, you haven't finished this basketball investigation and now you've got this name image likeness thing that you're going to have to deal with. We'll take, uh, we'll, we'll take a couple scholarships, uh, maybe some reduced visits, reduced evaluation days, whatever, but that's it. And uh, the, with the hope being that the NCAA says, you know what, uh, two years ago, we would fight this. We would throw the book at Tennessee. We would hammer them, but uh, whatever. We're, ju we're just going to sign off on this. You guys go away. Looks like uh, you're not going to do this again. Uh, some of it might be legal now going forward anyway. Uh, we just want to be done with it. So, yeah, wh whatever. We're going to accept your self-imposed penalties. That would probably be the best-case scenario for Tennessee right now. Russell, I'm, I, as I ask this question, I'm watching a video of Kennedy Chandler with uh, the Team USA uh, burying a three at the buzzer. And, of course, he's headed to Tennessee. It, and it gets me thinking about the level of recruit Rick Barnes is bringing to Knoxville that they don't know if a top 100 player is a take for them right now yeah. because they're in on four or five top 20 players nationally. They're recruiting at a John Calipari, Kentucky, uh, Mike Krzyzewski at Duke level right now. Are you surprised to see it at, at this level with the level and the caliber of recruits? visiting Knoxville seemingly every week? Look, I, I'm old enough to remember Wade Houston going 5-22 and 22 back in the day. So, yeah, I never thought I'd see say it like this. I'm also old enough to remember, uh, like, what, three or four years ago, some Tennessee fans, that was criticism of Rick Barnes, is right? He's no, he hasn't signed a top 100 player. Was it, you know, uh, I, I believe, uh, was it uh, DJ Burns was the first top 100 guy they signed, and then they got Josiah Jordan James. Since then, the floodgates have been opened, and yeah, they're turning away top 100 guys right now. I never thought I would see this with uh, Tennessee basketball, but it is definitely a, a golden era for the balls. And, uh, you know, Rick Barnes, hey, um, everything you want in a coach, right? Runs a clean program. He's funny, engaging in the public, recruits at a super high level. I don't think any of his players have ever gotten in any sort of off-the-court uh, trouble or nonsense that's been embarrassing to the, uh, the program. He's won a conference championship. He goes to the NCAA tournament every year. He does everything except win in March. Um, that's that's the, the, last, the last thing that he needs to do to secure his legacy as a Hall of Fame coach. Tennessee's never been to a Final Four. Uh, this is going to be, again, one of the most talented rosters in school history. And, guys, I just got to think, man, if – if he just keeps knocking on that door, recruiting the way he's doing it, over the next four or five years, uh, he's got to, if not by accident, make a Final Four. And uh, that would be the crowning achievement, I think, for Rick Barnes and Tennessee basketball. Russell Smith, the host of The Drive with Russell Smith on Fox Sports Knoxville Fan Run Radio. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter. Russell, is it two underscores or three in between your names? Uh, at Russell Smith. The triple underscore. Triple. Yeah, the, a lot, of, a lot of Smiths out there. You know, that was all that was left. The okay. guy who's at Russell Smith, he doesn't have any followers. I can't contact him. I would love to buy it. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, two S's, two L's, and the the rare triple underscore. Okay, I couldn't tell if it was two or three. I knew it wasn't one, but it's just yeah. this, it's this blank. Russell, uh, at Russell, three underscores, Smith. Reminiscent of uh, John McClain and yeah, how they, many they, underscores you, he has. Congrats on cornering the underscore market yep. with you and John McClain. He's got about five in his handle also. <laughs> so that's perfect. You guys love the underscore. Hey, we, we love uh, Fox Sports Knoxville. Yep. Uh, thank you so much. Tell everybody there we said hello, if you don't mind. And, uh, we will. Enjoy the show today. Uh, we, we will uh, retweet your account uh, with the link. I know you've got the, the Facebook link as well as uh, the, the online listen app. Uh, we'll be doing that for you from our account today. Appreciate it. You guys have a great weekend. Thanks for having me on. You Thanks, got it, Russell. Man. Appreciate you. Russell Smith has been our guest. Good chat there. And uh, for those tuned in uh, that said, oh, 
uh, Russell's now with VolQuest. No, no, no. <laughs> He's with Fox Sports Knoxville. Uh, VolQuest back with us next week. We have the VolQuest Power Hour each and every Friday. And Russell's going to be back, too. That was an excellent visit by yeah, him. We'll, we'll have him back. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Coming up, we preview the sports weekend. We update you on the UFC 264 parlay, among many other things to hit, including uh, one of the headlines out there, uh, Chad. Uh, did you see the pitcher that hit the homer last night? I did not. An, okay, incredible moment. Late. It was on the West Coast. Late moment uh, between the Padres and the Nationals. Chad and I tried to double up on a win. Was this Wednesday? Tuesday night? This was Tuesday night. We got bold. We won the big parlay, and we decided to just keep going. And we bet Nationals, I think. Yep, we bet Nationals, Padres. and we bet Rockies. Padres took care of the Nationals earlier this week. They took care of them last night and in dramatic fashion. We'll tell you about that straight ahead on OutKick 360. Outkick 360 across the Outkick network alongside Chad Withrow. I'm Jonathan Hutton. PK back with us on Monday. Quick shout out and congratulations to my sister Amy, uh, Alex and Amy Rock. Getting married today. Uh, congrats. What's uh, that last name again? Rop. Rop? Yeah. R O P P. Mr. and Mrs. Rop. Congratulations. Um, they are eloping. And we were having the discussion. Uh, Reed asked a great question in the warm-up today. Is it eloping if you tell everybody that you're going to get married? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I, guess, I mean, we know they're getting married today, but there's not a big ceremony. They're doing it very private, extremely private. Like, I, I can't tell you exactly where they're getting married, Chad. So that's eloping, right? No, I mean, I, I, I they're described do, They're doing it, more than just going to the courthouse. Yeah, I described it as a, a shotgun wedding without the pregnancy. <laughs> like, it's just a, it's a very quick, uh, put together, you know, just a witness. Like, yeah. They're not making a big scene of it. I mean, she had a shower. When, and when I hear eloping, I, I feel like it's like you're fleeing something. Oh, like you're, yeah. going, you're running away to elope because your parents disapprove. or Yeah, that's not the case. Uh, you're leaving your wife or someone else, and you're running off to elope. Like, that's, to me, <laughs> eloping, right? I don't, I don't see. What they're doing well, is... That's uh, not the case either. What they're doing is on the up and up. So it's not... Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I, maybe I just have a negative connotation to the term eloping. But when I hear... <laughs> I don't know what I can see Reed it. laughing, too, so I think he agrees. When I hear elope, I think you're running for the hills... To marry someone that no one else approves of. What would you call it, Reed? Like I don't, I don't know what else to say no, when, I'm, when I'm describing how this is going down. Because they're like Friday. I'm like, yeah, she's getting married Friday, and then they, you know, they leave for their honeymoon. No, I don't have an alternative oh. definition for this. I'm just saying, if, if you know, it's not eloping. Okay. Well, we do know. Uh, yeah. We do know. And we do also know that there's no shotgun involved, right? No. No. There's no two pink lines involved or anything like Nothing that. Nothing like okay. that. No, 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 no. Nothing like that. Um, and there's no major disapproval of either the bride or the groom, right? No. Okay. No. Well, then, no yeah, I, I, don't, I wouldn't describe I don't know. They just did not want a big wedding. It's just wedding. a private wedding. They didn't want wedding. a small one either. They just wanted a very private, they're having intimate a, wedding. They're having a private wedding is how it, it, it's, it. The, uh, it, it's the pastor uh, and a photographer and them. And that's it. I'm insulted that <laughs> Pastor Reed wasn't asked uh, to do this. <laughs> Chad's he's insulted got his... that Outkick 360 was not there to broadcast live. Yeah. Uh, at the. At well, the I wanted to do. A, I wanted to bring them to us. You know, if venue didn't matter. I would just. I mean, but right I, here. I wish there's a curtain behind us. <laughs> Unfortunately, that curtain opens up to a wall. I wish there was another room back there, and we could just take open the curtain, and then they walk through, and Reed marries them <laughs> on the show, and we fade to black. Yeah. <laughs> Amy, how dare you not take this very private, very key moment in your life and give it to us for show content? How dare you? How dare you be so selfish as to not think about your brother's show and how you could have benefited the show by getting married on air? That would have been just like Luke and Laura on General Hospital. Ratings would have been through the roof. Yeah. That's it. Congratulations to both of you. Charles and Alex, Diana, welcome all to the over family. again. Um, and uh, Alex, I don't know if you're on FanDuel or not. You should be. FanDuel.com slash OK360 is how you can do that. Uh, first time users this weekend, you can bet UFC 264, McGregor and Poirier, 30 to 1 odds. You can pick either fighter to win the fight by any means. 30 to 1 odds, McGregor or Poirier. You bet $5. That's the maximum bet. You have to deposit $10. Bet $5, you can win $150 on 30 to 1 odds in a, what is a very even fight. There's juice on both of the fighters. 
uh, with the money that you'd have to place if you're making the parlay with us or if you're just betting this uh, straight up on the money line, you can get 31 odds on the boost from FanDuel.com slash OK360. And the 360 parlay going into the weekend, we hope you'll join us for this. Uh, I said earlier, bet the fight however you want. I think it's very even. I'm going with Poirier, uh, and I'm giving the double chance by KO, TKO, or submission. Uh, Tai Tuavasa to knock out or win uh, by points, uh, by a decision, judge decision over Greg Hardy, and Sean O'Malley to win by knockout uh, in his fight. The reason why I think that is the one to bet and why even though we're picking by the means of the description of the fight on how it's going to finish Bashad O'Malley, if you go to the UFC website, I had never heard of this guy that he's fighting. If you go to the website, there's just a silhouette. There's like a shadowy figure in the in the headshot for this guy. They don't even have a mugshot of him. He's going to, to fight put the Undertaker? Up. They don't even have a, a photo to put next to Sean O'Malley's photo when you're facing them off. They do now because of all the you know press conferences and stuff. But when I saw that, I'm like, oh, th- that's why the odds are minus 1,000. I wonder, I wonder if someone was like in a... a Injury or I think sickness or protocol, COVID they had to pull si- someone, and then they're putting someone in his place. Yeah, maybe? It's, it's probably a, a short notice deal. And uh, props to those dudes taking a short notice fight and then cutting weight. Uh, it's going to be fun, fun weekend ahead for us. Uh, Chad, it was a fun night last night where uh, it was it, it was eight nothing Nationals over the Padres. The Padres come back and win nine eight in the bottom of the ninth, and one of the reasons why. Is the uh, they had a pitcher first at bat in league in his MLB career fourth inning grand slam off of Max Scherzer, and it's not like Scherzer just lobbed one down the middle he had two strikes on the pitcher. This guy golfs it. It was a low pitch in the dirt already two strikes. The guy's just trying to just put it in play and golfs it over the right field wall for a grand slam. It's been a good week. It's always a good week for pitchers hitting when uh, Otani is at the plate. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, Max Free to the Braves with a pinch hit, game winning. They came from behind 7 3 on Sunday against the Marlins and tied it and won an extra innings with a pitcher pinch hitting uh, to come in with the bases loaded and get the game winning hit also. Where are good they week this for weekend? pitchers hitting? Do we Braves know? are in Miami. Okay. Uh, so is it. Will a- we see another ejection? <laughs> this well, Miami's coming off of a good series against the Dodgers. Yeah. And they're, they're a hot team. I don't know. I, I would probably stay away from betting this series. Um, Orioles have the White Sox. Right now, according to FanDuel, the White Sox have the most money placed on them to win the World Series. I have a bet on the White Sox to win the World Series. I also have a bet on the Dodgers. But, yes, uh, the White Sox are a popular bet. And, uh, yeah, the Braves have struggled against the Marlins. I, I would, uh, in fact, I am betting the Marlins today to win as a slight underdog against the Braves. Hit us up on social media over the weekend at OutKick360. Subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. By subscribing to OutKick360 on YouTube, you're automatically entered to win the Sony and Hertz Odyssey prize pack, uh, which is outstanding. It's over a $2,500 value, and you get everything you see on the screen. It's the Sony AX3000 car stereo with Apple CarPlay. Hertz Audison 520 watt amp and a 400 watt powered sub box and the speaker system. You get all of that. Uh, one of our subscribers will win this at the end of August. Just hit subscribe, hit the alert button so you know every time we go live, which again will go live Monday, noon Eastern, right here across the Outkick Network. Have a great weekend. Hey, it's Jonathan Hutton. Thanks for listening to Outkick 360. Be sure to subscribe to the show to have the latest podcast delivered to you each and every day. And give us five stars. It helps us grow our network and provide you with more great podcasts like this one.